In 2012, two families left the city along with the conveniences of modern American living. Today, our family has decided to live in the mountains of the American Ozarks to build for themselves a more sustainable and fulfilling lifestyle. We are an American homestead! This week on An American Homestead, Jamie cans up some prize-winning squash, and I give you an update on the sawmill. Thanks for watching, and be sure to visit us online at anamericanhomestead.com. Hey everybody, welcome to the homestead. Got a lot of stuff for you this episode. Let's get started. something about laundry which I feel like I've said a, a lot about laundry before but I've been doing laundry using this laundry system for more than three years now going on four and it's still going strong I'm still going strong <laughs> um, listen you guys it's a lot of hard work I mean it it's really convenient to throw your clothes in the wash and I really have to work on scheduling my day to make sure I get laundry done on the days that I need it to get done. I'm not in the house doing homeschool right now because I'm out here doing laundry. So I try to get the kids started on school. Um, Caleb is running around here somewhere. He's obviously not doing school right now because he needs my attention for school, for preschool. But um, I'm out here doing laundry. And if you have the desire to do it, you can totally make it work. I think that anybody can make it work. You just have to schedule your time and you have to be consistent and make sure it gets done and doesn't pile up. That's probably the biggest thing. But you know, I've been really encouraged lately because we've been getting messages from the website and people sending pictures and testimonies of people doing their laundry by hand. It's kind of crazy because I didn't know um, anybody that was doing laundry this way when I started it, but it feels like there's kind of a movement going on, which I think is really cool. Um, actually, the Molly Green magazine that I write for just came out with their fall issue, and another homesteader wrote about how she does laundry off-grid. She does the exact same way I do. And I have it on good authority that she was really happy that I was excited to see that in the magazine. So I guess she's a fan of me doing laundry. <laughs> Decided to try it herself. I don't know, but she's excited about it. And I think that anybody can do it. You just have to have the desire and you have to be consistent. It'll get hard eventually, but you know, you just push through and say, you oh, know, this is what I do now and just keep going.
So it's been our plan to go ahead and put a pavilion over the top of our sawmill. And that is to protect the sawmill, number one, just to, so that we can work in, you know, adverse weather conditions, whether it be a little bit of rain or some snow or whatever, and just work down here under cover. And uh, also, but really to protect the mill from just weathering. And so I, I want to make sure it lasts for a long time. And the, the guy we bought it from urged us to go ahead and protect it, put a, put a cover, put a building or something over the top of it. And so what you see behind me are a number of cedar posts, and these cedar posts um, were harvested here on the property and put on the mill and just kind of uh, squared off a little bit, usually about five and a half by five and a half or six by sixes, roughly, to sink into the ground. And at the bottom of each post is a block where the truss will sit that we have. And on top of that block, um, the truss will sit and be put up against the, the post and then bolted to the post. And so um, there are uh, just thousands and thousands of chicken barns in the area. There's a lot of chicken, you know, Tyson, a bunch of different uh, chicken companies that raise chickens. And because there's so many chicken barns, people are constantly tearing the old ones down and putting new ones up. And a lot of entrepreneurial individuals have uh, made businesses of taking down the old ones and then taking those materials that they've taken apart from these old chicken barns and then reselling these, uh, the good materials, the, the materials that can be salvaged and reselling them to people like me. And, uh, you know, for a bit different building projects or whatever. And so we found one of these places that just ended up, they're kind of like functional junkyards where you go around and you pick out the good materials that you want. And we got a number of sh uh, pieces of sheet metal uh, to go over the top to be the roof of it. And um, two by fours and two by sixes. Uh, the two by fours are going to be used as purlins for the trusses that'll that'll go up here behind me, and um, you know it's it's we've got this thing together. Let me go ahead and take you over, show you the trusses that we have, and just kind of give you some close up of what we got going here. So this is where it's at today. We have uh, our post in the ground around the mill. Walk over here and on the outside post, uh, the truss. This is the the highest post here, and so the truss is going to sit on the ground right there where my foot is and it will come up about six foot and over on this this post here they the truss will sit on the inside of this post sit on top of this block and then get bolted into uh, the post right there and this one here again you can see uh, the block has been uh, bolted in and it'll, the truss will sit on top of there it'll go up about six foot and then get bolted into uh, the side of that post and then on this last one here uh, the truss will sit on that block and then get bolted into this post and it'll span across over there and uh, I think the distance is about 31 uh, feet 3 inches for the truss. The trusses are over here on the ground. This one here has been laid out so we could measure it. So we laid it out on the ground and the grass is kind of growing over the top of it. We did this last week and so the grass is coming over it and laid it flush up against the other one here and then measured it out and then here's the rest of the trusses that we purchased and we just had them laid these are old chicken barn trusses from one of the tyson chicken barns one of the older ones that again they just recycle the materials and sell them i mean it's good stuff it's a little bit rusted but it's good material and it's cheap so that'll work just fine so there's our trusses getting ready to can squash today. I have our great big winter squash that I'm going to can for the year and I really like to do that because it's really really big and so we can't obviously eat it all in one sitting but also I love to can it because I make my own pumpkin. I can it in cubes because that's the safe way to do it. You don't want to do pumpkin puree. There's something about it doesn't can, right, and botulism and all that stuff. I just think it's easy to can in cubes. You don't even have to puree it. Um, when I do it in cubes and then I'll open up the jar, I'll drain off the liquid, and then it's really easy to mash. And so I'll use that for making bread, making pie, things like that in the winter. And it's really cool to have my own pumpkin jars at the Dollar General yesterday and I needed a lot more of the regular mouth 
quart jars. I had used all of mine. I have a lot of stock canned right now. So I needed more of these. Um, these I found for $8.50, a whole dozen of them. They're on sale right now at the Dollar General, and I've had people ask me where's the best place to buy jars, the cheapest <laughs> place to buy jars because they can get expensive. Um, I think the Dollar General, and you want to go, if you're interested, you want to go right now because we're nearing the end of canning season, so they've brought the price down. So if your Dollar General has them, they're usually out in the, in the um, middle of the store where they put all of the stuff that they've um, put on sale. done canning I got nine quarts of pumpkin this is from our great big squash so a friend was here visiting and she said well what do you plan to do with that squash and I told her well think about it like it's one of those cans of pumpkin so you can make pumpkin pie I definitely make a lot of pumpkin bread what I'll do is run this through a strainer I'll get all the water out and then it's a quick mash and I it basically amounts to one of those cans of pumpkin, you know, like the Libby's pumpkin that you buy in the store, just the 15 ounce can. So that's what I'll use to make pumpkin bread and pumpkin pie. These are all the seeds we pulled out of the pumpkin. I had Joshua count them and he said he got about 500. So we're going to be selling them on our website, award-winning blue ribbon pumpkin. So we're constantly making our own wine here on the homestead, and I have some wine, some peach wine, that's from all the peaches that we harvested and canned and put into our pantry. All of those cuttings and the skins and the cores that we didn't use, we boiled that down to make a juice and then we turned it into wine. And so that's fermenting right now over at the house, and it's about time for it to be starting to rack it into another jar. And um, the last time I did that, I did not take this jar and wash it out. Um, just forgot to do that so I set it outside and I had it took me a while to get the um, the white oak burned cores out of it because we put white oak that's charred white oak inside of our carboys when we make wine it gives it that oak barrel flavor uh, provides a wonderful flavor and uh, so I worked those out of there but there's still this scum on the bottom of the jar that I need to remove and the best way I have found to do this was uh, a hint I got from someone else was to take gravel and put gravel down in here with some water and then swish it around and that's what I do over here at the old well house uh, this well was dug back in the mid 19th century in the 1850s and we use uh, this well on a regular daily basis. Jamie keeps all of our sauerkraut down there to keep cold because it stays at a constant around 50 degrees or so and a good place to store for a cold storage and so we keep in baskets and in different things down in the well some cold storage but um, when I want to come wash out the carboys for wine making I use the gravel 
that's here on the floor that we put down when we moved here and I just put it in there and it works as like a Brillo pad all along the bottom of this carboy and gets all the dirt out and then when I'm done I just pour it out and I pour it right back on the ground and, until I need it the next time but it's a simple way to go ahead and clean your stuff folks I'm going to show you some tricks later on I have tasted a lot of homemade wine by people who are like, hey, you check out my homemade wine, and it tastes horrible. And the reason for so many off taste in the wine is because you let bacteria get inside of your wine. Foreign bacteria that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be there, and the wine just takes an off flavor. It's horrible. And so... Um, I'm going to show you how people back a long time ago got rid of that bacteria and they made good wine, okay? Um, using rocks is not going to, you know, put bad bacteria in your wine. you got to wash it out later. I'll show you how to do that. But this is a great way to scrub the inside of your glass carboys, uh, a great off-grid way because I don't have any, you know, mechanical devices. I don't have any high-pressure hot water to spray down in here. Um, I'm going to show you how I do it in this process, so stick with us. I got most of this cleaned out. Uh, all the scum is gone. I just need to go ahead and rinse it out and get some of the debris from the rocks out of it. Uh, but I'll do a couple rinsings and this will be good to go. Now it's clean, ready to go, rinsed out. Now I just have to disinfect it. We'll show you how we do that. So this is the carboy with my peach wine. I'm going to take the peach wine from this carboy and rack it into this new clean carboy but the problem is it's not clean yet it needs to be disinfected so we're going to do that 99 percent of the problems or 90 percent of the problems of the people i talk to whose wine does not turn out to be good wine it, it has an off flavor it doesn't taste good it's because really two things i've found they're not using a proper airlock like this bubbler right here um, they're using um, nothing or they're using a piece of cloth or they're using a balloon Forget all that. Just go to Amazon, go to eBay, spend the $7 or whatever it is, and buy a proper airlock for your wine. It'll save you a whole world of problems. Um, and the other thing that they're not doing is disinfecting their equipment when they're making wine. Every single piece of equipment that this wine comes into contact with, whether it's the racking or whether it's the bottling or whether it's um, you know, the, any type of preparing when you're making your wine initially or the carboy, it needs to be disinfected. And I don't use any chemicals except for the very end when I do my bottling. I clean my bottles with star sand. But everything else, it's just boiling water. That's it. Boiling water. Uh, back a long time ago when people made wine, they didn't use carboys. They used animal skins to make their wine. And before they put the wine inside of the animal skins, they, bo they put boiling hot water in those animal skins and then sealed it off uh, to make sure no bacteria got in there. And that boiling water kept everything clean. So what I'm advising you to do is before any part of your wine touches any part of your equipment, you guys need to put boiling water through everything and you'll, it'll save you a world of problems. Here's another good tip on how to make good wine. Instead of filling your airlock with water, 
try vodka instead. Vodka is high in alcohol, it's a disinfectant, it will kill any bacteria that gets inside of your airlock. Water can grow bacteria. If bacteria gets in your water, it could grow, and that could affect, uh, uh, potentially af affect your wine. So instead of putting water in your airlock, try vodka instead. Homesteaders have been making their own wine for a long time. It's an easy process, a simple process, process that can turn out very well if you follow some simple rules. We're going to come out with a video coming out shortly on five great tips on how to make great wine on your homestead. Hey guys, one more episode, season three. Tune in next week to see the season finale. You're not going to want to miss it. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in each week and sharing our videos on Facebook and Twitter. We really appreciate you guys, all of our subscribers. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. We'll see you next time on an American Homestead. This is our new kitty. She just came yesterday. She's learning how to live on the homestead. <laughs> Zach and I joke that she kind of uh, didn't win out on the lottery of life because she didn't go to an old lady to live inside a nice comfy house. She's with us and that means that she has to learn to brave it outside and um, kind of survival of the fittest out there. We do have a deck and the deck has a gate and so she's up here on the deck so until she's old enough she'll stay up here. But our last little kitten, what was she probably maybe four months? Maybe four months old? She got bitten we think probably by a rattlesnake or a copperhead and her head was swollen I don't know, two or three times its size, and she was in a lot of pain, and we lost her. So that was a couple months ago now, and we have this one. We named it Tiger. What are we gonna name it Cookies? No, it's Tiger. She has a little orange, and she has kind of stripes that look like a tiger stripes, but I know, she's black and white, but she has a little orange behind her ears. Okay. <laughs> I didn't like cookies, so she's Tiger. Anyway, so um, there she is. Hopefully she makes it. <laughs>